Using stomach 40 as a low connecting point connecting the stomach to the spleen is a true gem when it comes to metabolism syndrome or blood sugar imbalances. Today I'm going to talk about the relationships of the yin and the pair yang organs, like the spleen and stomach, the long and the large intestine, the heart and the small intestine, which are often hard to understand where the connection is with those two, the liver and the gallbladder, the kidney and the bladder, and also the pericardium and the sanjiao. That way we can truly utilize the Luo connecting point in clinical practice to help our patients because it's really important to understand the relationship between the yin and the paired young organs. Welcome back to my channel. If it's your first time here, I'm Clara from Acupore Academy and I create Chinese medicine and acupuncture content for students and practitioners, making it easy to grasp and fun to learn. If you haven't subscribed yet, please click the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any new videos. Let's go. Now, what I love about the stomach and the spleen is that to me, they have the perfect yin yang relationship according to Chinese medicine because they are completely opposite. The stomach chi, when it's healthy, goes down, right? If it's unhealthy, it goes up and we have nausea, we have acid reflux, vomiting, etc. The spleen, on the other hand, when it's happy and healthy, it raises clear chi to the head and it keeps the organs from falling down, so it goes up. When it's unhappy or unhealthy, the spleen goes down and we are very tired, exhausted, chronic fatigue, and maybe even prolapse of organs. So see how they're completely opposite. Second, the spleen has tendency to be affected by dampness, so excess body fluid, and by cold. The spleen does not like cold. The stomach is the opposite. It gets affected by heat and then by dryness. So very much dry and heat affects the stomach, but cold and damp affect the spleen. So see how very much opposite, which is really cool because they work really well together. However, digestive system is at the center of our health. And because the spleen and stomach are such opposite, if there is a lot of cold affecting the spleen, for example, and we eat a lot of warm food, it might be too warm, too hot, too fast, and now the stomach has too much heat, and now we have excess heat in the stomach. Vice versa, if the stomach has a lot of heat and we want to cool it down with cooling food, cooling formulas, we have to be careful because it might make the spleen too cold, right? So it's a fine balance between the two, and that's why diet and talking about health and how we eat our eating habits makes a huge difference. It takes time, consistency, but it's really at the center of balancing our whole health. So I love that connection. What's the connection between the heart and the small intestine? Because really, where is the connection? When I was back in school, in TCM school, I had a really hard time understanding why the heart is connected to the small intestine. What does it have to do with anything? So it separates the clear from the turbid as a function in the physical aspect. In the emotional aspect, and this is where things are gonna get connected, the small intestine also separates the clear from the turbid. And what does that mean? It is the ability of having clear judgment and being able to separate right from wrong, right? So for example, when I see a patient that is in an abusive relationship, doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, they are with a partner that's abusive in their relationship. It could be physically or emotionally or both. But that person is excusing and saying, oh, but they love me, but it's okay because, you know, it's my fault. I did it. I created this, this atmosphere. It's all my fault. It is a small intestine issue, not being able to separate the right from the wrong. Make sense? So when it comes to the connection between the heart and the small intestine, there's two things. On the mental aspect, as you know, the heart is in charge of all our emotions, all our clear thinking, with the spleen sending clear chi to the head. So when the small intestine is not able to separate right from wrong, there is phlegm in the brain. There is phlegm in the heart, right? If someone is going to take a gun and start shooting at everybody, there is phlegm in the brain, right? There is an imbalance because the person is not seeing this as wrong. So there's a mental health aspect that's affecting the heart mind. That's the connection. The second one is when there is heart fire, it can create fire in the small intestine. How does that show? Often that shows with interstitial cystitis. 
So cystitis is an inflammation of the urethra and the ureter that creates really painful urination, maybe even blood in the urination, but the person does not have an infection. And I see a lot of women with IC in my practice over the years, and every one of them have insomnia. They don't sleep well for many years. So that affects the small intestine. And often we use a point like heart five. Heart five is the lower connecting point of the heart to the small intestine. And that's a great point you have when there is interstitial cystitis. Isn't that cool? I love Chinese medicine. Woo! The relationship between the lung and the large intestine is twofold. The first one is the immune system. The lung is in charge of the defensive chi, the immune system, and so is the large intestine because in the physical organ, we have probiotics, which are fighting invaders, which are fighting bacteria, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing that's connecting the two is the skin. They both manifest on the skin, and this is part of the five element theory, right? When we talked about the five element, both large intestine and lung manifest on the skin. So when someone has a lot of constipation, it might come out on the skin with zits or eruption or cystic acne. It could be hormonal. I'm not saying this is what happened every time you have a zit, but I'm going to tell you a story that's really interesting, for example. So I moved to Canada from France many, many, many moons ago, because now I'm in my late fifties. Oh my God, time flies. Anyway, when I was from France, born there, I ate bread, of course, I ate baguette and croissant. So I moved to Canada, and I have to tell you, as a teenager, I never ever had a zit or acne at all, ever, in my life. And within two years of being in Canada, I started having massive cystic acne, like a lot of acne, really, really painful. And I was just like, what is happening to me? So I went and had my hormone checks. Everything was fine with my hormones. I'm like, I don't understand. And it lasted quite a long time until I figured out that the gluten or the wheat in North America is processed completely differently than in Europe. And my gut, my large intestine was like, no, 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 I don't like this. And that created inflammation. It took two years for the wheat that I was eating here to create massive inflammation in my large intestine. So I thought, okay, well, let's stop the wheat and see what happened. Within a month, my whole skin cleared, completely cleared. See how the large intestine and the skin, right? And then I remember the first time we went back to France with my husband after I went gluten-free, he said to me, what are you gonna do when we go to France? And I said, I don't care if I look like, you know, I have zits all over, I'm having baguette, I'm having croissant, I'm gonna have everything. Nothing happened. When I was in France, nothing happened. Anywhere I've been in Europe, nothing has changed my skin. Here, if I have a little piece of cake at a birthday party, the next day I wake up and I have a zit right away. So obviously it's processed differently, but the point here is that my large intestine is telling me something on my skin. That's the relationship between the long and large intestine. Liver gallbladder relationship is very simple. You know, when we have a lot of tension on our shoulder, this is where gallbladder 21 is. One of the best points when we have traps or a trapezius muscle that is so tense and tight because we have a lot of stress. As we know, liver is affected by stress because liver moves chi all over the body, allowing us to be relaxed. When we are stressed, shoulders tighten, and that's the gallbladder meridian that we can utilize to relax the shoulder. This is a great trigger point to relax all that tension up in the upper tracks, right? So that's also another point that we use is gallbladder 34, which is one of the best points for influential point of the sinews, tendons, ligament, and joints. This is the best point when there is issue with the joints. So that complements the liver very, very well. Make sense? I know, I, I love those two together because also when we have temporal headaches, which is often due to stress, right? At the end of the day, people are like, oh, I have a temporal headache, and we know it's liver yang rising. The best points are going to be around the gallbladder meridian, which goes on the temporal area we are going to use the gallbladder. And absolutely like gallbladder 41, gallbladder 40, distal point to allow temporal headache to be relieved. So see, they work really well together. Let's look at the bladder and the kidney. So we know this because it's easy. In the Western sense, the bladder excretes the fluid that we don't need through urination, right? The bladder and the kidney work very well in transforming fluids and excreting fluid because of course the kidney is in charge of 
water metabolism in the lower jaw. So the kidney and the bladder work really well and they get affected by fear. And it's easy to see because when there is a fear or shock, the person can have bladder incontinence, right? Or lose bladder control. So that's the fear affects both of them. And that's their relationship in that perspective. Now also the sangio and the pericardium, let's talk about that connection. The pericardium is the protector of the heart, right? It's the protector of the heart in the physical aspect because the pericardium function is to have great blood flow and blood circulation, but it's also mental aspect to protect the heart from being affected emotionally very deep. Now the pericardium and the Sanjiao connection, their connection is very much more mental than physical or emotional versus physical. And you can see together they affect the person's capacity to relate to other people in the external world, so outside of themselves. So when people have a really hard time with being in the crowd, being with a lot of people, feel really anxious when there's too many people, that's a Sanjiao and pericardium not properly connecting or working together. I just wanted to remind you that about all the graphic you saw today are all from this book. As you can see, like I have three books, but this book is where I have the Chinese Medicine Foundation and Diagnosis. All my books come in digital version or hard copy. They ship all over the world. If they don't ship to your country, unfortunately, that does happen. Unfortunately, you can get the PDF version, which has a lot of video links to complement it. And the link of all my books is below this video. I have tons of resource on my website, resource page, tons of PDF, free courses, treatment protocols, lots of videos, lots of blog posts and courses and my books. Everything is there. Use the search bar when you're looking for something, let's say tinnitus, put it in the search bar and it'll come up for you and then you'll find it. It's super easy to use and I keep adding all the time. So definitely use my website for that.